Welcome back to the All Turtles podcast, a show about the future of work, the future of health, and entrepreneurs building the future with tech like AI. This is another shelter-in-place episode that we're recording remotely. Today, I'm interviewing George Arison. George is the founder and CEO of Shift, which is a marketplace for buying and selling used cars online. George has been very open about how the coronavirus pandemic has impacted Shift, and today I'm asking him how he's navigated the tough choices involved in managing a company during a global crisis. So I'm joined today, uh, sheltered in place again, with with George Arison, who's the founder and CEO of Shift, which is a really cool company. It's an online peer-to-peer marketplace for buying and selling used cars. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's correct. And we're actually <laughs> open, which is great. So if you need to buy a car, go to shift.com. I know, you know, I spent a lot of time on the road in and around the Bay Area. And and since, George, we had you on the part podcast a few months ago, and I know you've just been a friend of Phil's for a long time. I now I, I can't not see shift bumpers, uh, you know, <laughs> license, license plate banners like everywhere I go. So great job. Thank you. But we're, we're here to talk about, uh, I guess, a topic that's on a lot of people's minds and a lot of startups minds in particular. And that's uh, what's going on with shelter in place and what, what, what happens when you're running a multi hundred, multi thousand person company that's growing and you kind of suddenly have to put the brakes on things operationally, at least in certain areas. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a crazy time, right? Who would have ever thought uh, that something like this would happen? Uh, but here we are. We um, started planning for this probably moderately early. I don't want to say like super early because I'm sure other people were way ahead of us. But um, we started to think about it seriously kind of late February, early March. Like what happens if um, they start to um, tell us that we can't do the business we, we normally would? Um, and what kind of impact would that have you know, on our um, kind of financial situation and, and runway as well, because we were planning on going out to fundraise um, later this year, um, probably kind of in the May, June timeframe. So not the ideal time to be sheltering in place from that perspective. Right, right. Um, and so we came up with a plan of what to do. It was, you know, I want to say like super aggressive, but definitely reasonably aggressive. Um, and as soon as we started to, um, you know, get orders about um, staying at home, et cetera, we started to kind of implement that. The good news for our business is we actually are open and our entire product was built around the notion of test drive brought to the customer to their house. That's right. Um, and so if you want to buy a car from Shift, you go to the website, you find the car you want, and then you can either you know book a test drive where the car shows up at your house, um, or you can buy the car you know right away online and then the car will be delivered to you post-purchase. So in a world where kind of delivery to your house is allowed, um, Shift is awesome from that perspective. Um, and that has allowed us to kind of stay stay open. Um, we also do normally allow people to come to our, our warehouse to see cars. Um, and there's a portion of customers that really wants to do that, especially for older vehicles, because you kind of might want to see more than one car when you make a decision like that. And so we had to shut that part of our business down. But otherwise, um, we're fully operational. The challenges for us from the operational perspective are kind of, I think, threefold. Number one is you've got to be a lot more careful, right, with, with the operation itself and with your right. employees. And so we've implemented a lot of things to to kind of make sure that our, our employees are staying safe. Secondly, we've also had to do the same thing for our customers. And so we created a concept called a no-touch um, test drive or no-contact test drive, I think, is the, is the branding that we came up with. Um, so there, everyone just you know, holds their hands in the air and <laughs> exactly. no, no one's on the wheel. Uh, it's, it's So basically when the driver brings the car to the customer, um, we then wipe the, the steering wheel, we wipe the keys with um, you know, hand sanitizer, et cetera, um, and then allow a customer to actually go on the test drive without our driver in the car. Um, so our, our drivers are called concierge, and so the concierge doesn't go in the car with you. Mm-hmm. Um, that, help, that helps kind of make sure that the customer you know, is, uh, is, doesn't have to be worried about um, any germs, et cetera, which, uh, which works out. And we had to get special permission from our insurance company to do that because normally we have to have somebody from shift in the car with a customer, but they were pretty cooperative on that. So that's worked out really well. Um, and so far has been going quite well. And then thirdly, kind of the third big impact, obviously, is that whenever there's economic disruption, you know, people hold off on making big purchases. So while I actually think that demand for cars will jump dramatically over the next six months, right. um, especially used cars, because I think people will be terrified of getting into public transportation um, and Lyft and Uber. So demand will be higher than it has ever been. Yeah. Um, in the immediate term, people are not willing to make big decisions. And so 
what we've noticed is is that um, number one, um, we have a lot of people who are um, coming to the website uh, but are not, um, you know, deciding to book a test drive. They're kind of looking at at cars but not actually buying. And the second really interesting thing that's happened is that we've seen a huge increase in searches for domestic vehicles mm. um, as compared to to non domestic cars. Um, and so that's been that's been really interesting um, as well. Um, I, I don't I can't really say why that's happening, but it, it definitely is. Uh, and it's like pretty substantial. Something like you know searches for domestic cars went up like forty or fifty percent, uh, versus the searches for uh, you know import cars went down by about twenty five percent. Now normally uh, imports are searched a lot more than domestic cars, and we have a lot more imports than domestic cars. But right. in this environment, that's been really really interesting. So that's interesting that that traffic's up on the site and. However, people will be spending, I imagine, just much longer in this consideration phase. You know, it's going to be a challenge for your product and marketing team to figure out how to nurture those people or give them a service in the meantime or some kind of like pre-purchase engagement or... Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, definitely challenging. Um, uh, there's a couple of challenges with that, right? Number one is just the fact that we are the only kind of true car sale platform that's open right now. Um, right. In terms of being able to bring cars to the customer, because dealerships are all closed, like literally the Northern California order for the six counties, you know, <laughs> said that um, you are not allowed to sell cars in a dealership, but online uh, purchase brought to the customers allowed. So mm-hmm. like it's almost almost like I mean, one of my employees joke like George, did you write that order yourself? Was kind of the, the comment. Um, but uh, uh, so uh, you know. That, that's definitely like people knowing that we are open is, is hard, right? Number one. Um, and then number two is, you know, you want a much better research and discovery on your website to kind of nurture customers over the long term. Um, and so um, that's another thing where, you know, we're actively um, working on, uh, on kind of providing customers with. Um, one thing we found, though, which is quite intriguing, is that marketing costs um, are, are really cheap right now. Um, they're down actually like massively. Things that would have cost you uh, on for TV, for example, a hundred dollars uh, before lockdowns is now like yeah. thirty bucks. Wow! Um, so like it's a huge decrease in, in costs. How is that? Everyone's watching TV now. <laughs> yeah, but no one wants to market, right? Like right, when companies right. start facing cash flow challenges, the first thing they stop is, is marketing. Um, and so we are actually going to go on television for the first time ever in Shift's history this week because um, the cost is so much better. We're like, hey, let's try it out and see what happens. Um, and see if it kind of uh, works, right? So we'll see what happens with that. We're going to do just a couple of weeks of, of trial um, for that and, and see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely uh, a, an interesting time to be to be in business. And, you know, my view is this has been also interesting to kind of think about, like, hey, what will investors look for, right? Because I, I don't think anyone's going to be doing a year-over-year comparison in, in terms of right. how your business is doing because you can't. Right. <laughs> um, and so we've been spending a lot of time talking to bankers about that. And I think, the gist of the message is, hey, what people are going to most care about is, um, are you able to show that you, you kind of got a business to a certain kind of steady state level? And then were you able to grow from there, you know, every week, every month? And so for us, that's a really critical thing where can we show growth over the next, you know, few weeks, few months, so that when markets do become more open to private fundraising, um, we can go out there and get a raise done. I do think it's really good news that some funding is happening, right? I mean, Airbnb's $1 billion raise might have been very expensive from the um, warrants perspective and, and right. um, valuation. But compared to 2008, at least funding is happening. Uh, whereas in 2008, just, you know, private funding wouldn't happen at all. So I think right now, kind of the better known brands can raise, um, you know, at maybe not ideal valuation, but can still get capital done. So that suggests like in a couple of months, hopefully, you know, everybody else will have access to capital as well. Can we spend a few minutes talking about kind of a live wire, a, a hard topic? And that's, I, I saw your interview with Biz on Protocol, uh, yeah. which is a, a great writer. And, and you, you said something, it, w- it was like, you know, there's, there's no time to process the stages of grief. Like you have to move decisively. And, you know, I thought about that. And I thought about that in context of when this was all first happening, there were some prominent VCs coming forward kind of dictating a response like, you know, cut a third of your staff, uh, implement pay cuts, um, shelter in place and like, you know, extend the runway and see this through. And which is, you know, going to be the case for many, many startups. But I I just wonder how you balance maybe acting uh, reflexively 
with actually making some of these decisions and communicating them to your team and, you know, deciding this is the right thing for us. Just, you know, what was that process like for you and, and how did you actually implement it? Yeah, so we thought about it even before it happened, right? As soon as it was kind of clear that something might happen, we started to work on plans for what we could implement. Um, and our board was also pretty good about kind of raising this in advance and saying, hey, we better like come up with a plan for something before it ever even happened, right? Which put us in a really good place because we had a set of plans. And depending on what level of challenge we faced, we could then kind of pursue the right path, right? So for example, I mentioned, I think that we're planning on fundraising. So if, if just the markets kind of shut down and there was going to be a lot of commotion in the public markets, we we're going to take certain steps. If there was a lockdown, we we're going to take more aggressive steps, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of had a chance to think through that all before it happened and, and had a plan. Um, I don't want to say I'm lucky, but, you know, Toby and I, um, uh, Toby's my co-CEO at Shift, um, and I both have been through a process of layoffs before um, at Shift. Uh, we, you know, in the past had a period of time when we really overhired and needed to um, cut back our workforce to something that was more manageable back in 2016. And, and back then it took me like, 60 days to get ready to do layouts, right? Because it's so painful and so difficult. And, and um, like emotionally, I wasn't in any way ready because I'd never done that. But in some ways, like I was really fortunate that I had had to go through that experience because doing them now um, was a lot easier for me to kind of swallow and comprehend because I also knew what process I had to go through to make it happen. Um, and so for us, the choices we made were the following. Number one, um, we implemented a, a company-wide salaried employees cut on salary. So we reduced everyone's compensation by 25%. That includes, you know, all senior executives, um, myself and Toby as well, everybody. Um, the theory there was, hey, we want to try to reduce furloughs as much as possible um, and have everybody be in this together um, because that's more important, most important thing that, that we, could, we could do. Right. And secondly, you know, we do have a, a very large non-salaried workforce as well. So these are people who are hourly. Um, there, it's a lot tougher because that is directly tied to the number of sales we're doing and the volume that we're doing and the customers we're serving. Of course. And we knew that, you know, there was going to be a reduction in volume. Um, there was going to be a reduction in volume from acquisition perspective. So this is when we buy cars from consumers. Even though demand for that service is massive right now, we have like more people going to our sell my car page than ever we've ever had before. Um, we are being very careful with cars that we are willing to buy because we don't know what valuations will be in a month or two months. Um, and so we cannot take a lot of risk. And so we're being really careful with what prices we offer customers and what cars we're willing to buy. And then on the sales side, so like actually selling cars to customers, we know we expected a decrease because just the economic uncertainty always causes uh, a decrease in sales. And so we you know, plan for a pretty substantial um, decrease in, in that regard. And um, hopefully things will be better kind of over time and we can bring people back. But what we didn't want to do is just do kind of complete layoffs that just didn't um, seem right and, and make sense. Um, and so what we end up implementing in the in the field team in the operation side is, uh, you know, number one, furloughs. So people get to stay on shared health insurance, but they're not being paid by us. Um, and they can apply for unemployment if they'd like, or if they get another job, obviously they can pursue that path as well. Um, and number two is whenever we could, we cut hours down. Um, so people still get some hours from shift, but not the hours they used to. Um, and so different teams kind of were handled differently. And, and, you know, some had to be steeper than others because we knew that the impact on those teams would be higher. That was really, really tough to do, right? Because you're like, this, this is the time when people need a paycheck and taking it away is really difficult. But at the same time, you had to do what is right for the business and for the broader um, set of stakeholders involved, right? Both our employees overall and our shareholders, because right. you have to be present to win. Um, and this is an environment in which presence um, became a lot harder, not just for us, but for almost everybody else. Um, you know, even if you are like a company that might have very minimal impact from coronavirus, um, just pure fact that valuations in the public markets are down by a third to a half will impact you in terms of you being able to raise capital next time, right? And for consumer businesses like ours, the impact is huge. For consumer businesses that cater to anything travel-related, the impact is even bigger. And so it's a really tough time, and you have to think of the whole, and you think of, have to think of all your shareholders, um, unfortunately, and, and it's really tough. And so, you know, I'm very happy with some of the moves the government is making to kind of help along this process. 
you know, I'm a pretty libertarian to conservative person, and so I don't really like government being involved in business, but this is a situation where government fiat caused this environment and kind of yep. they're forcing this on us. And I think it's a very different environment from the perspective of kind of taking government money um, or having them help businesses. And so um, I'm happy that that's happening and hopefully that'll kind of soothe in the curve a little bit here and we will have less unemployed than we would have had otherwise. But obviously it's still a really, really tough, really tough thing. I, I bet you have a strong opinion on the PPP loan and uh, some of the measures that the government's taking to uh, keep small businesses afloat. Yeah, I, I've been pretty pretty loud about it so far. So <laughs> I, I think it's a really good plan. Um, now, obviously, everyone wishes that the implementation had been better. But, uh, you know, the fact that Congress got together and so quickly moved to spend so much money supporting small businesses is great. Um, I also like the fact that it's directly tied to keeping people employed. Um, so that we have less people on unemployment uh, insurance, which is, is advantageous. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who are saying, well, sure, but then because of this addition to the unemployment insurance, people will be making more money through unemployment um, than they would through being employed. Um, that's understandably tough, but at the same time, it's really important to keep people employed, and there's a lot of benefits uh, to employment besides just the dollar amount that you make. And so I'm very happy with that structure kind of that requires uh, people to uh, uh, to keep people employed. Uh, that's really good. Um, we, uh, I know, I know it from startup perspective. A lot of um, VCs, um, not a lot, but some portion of VCs have been quite negative about startups applying for this. Um, I really, really strongly disagree. Um, I think that uh, it was really important to have as flexible set of rules for applying as possible. Uh, I wish they had even been more flexible on the affiliation rules than they are, but you know they're being more flexible than they have been in the past. Um, and again, this is a government cost fiat, and I think you owe it to your shareholders um, to try to get as much capital as possible to help you if your business was directly impacted by this, which I think most businesses out there, whether they're startups or not, um, have been impacted by this, right? Like being forced to work from home is a huge impact. Being right. losing customers is a huge impact, et cetera. So I think if you qualify, people should apply, and, and I really strongly um, kind of support that. Um, I also think that in practice, Congress will need to do more, right? This is meant to cover eight weeks of payroll, but the impact of this is going to be way bigger. And so um, I really hope that they start thinking about the fact that, hey, we got to double this in size at least to make it be 16 weeks of payroll, not eight weeks of payroll, and maybe even more um, because um, businesses will need help reopening, right? We are lucky. We we are, you know, in business still not fully. I mean, our sales are down about 30% or so. Um, from where we had hoped they would be right now, but but they're still happening. Uh, a lot of our businesses are just completely shut down. And so businesses will need help reopening um, and getting their revenue to come back, so to say. And so um, there will be more will be needed. I mean, I think now they're talking about, you know, adding $250 billion. That's right. Just to kind of re- replenish the, the fund so that they have enough money to cover everybody who's asking for it for this first batch. But I think you'll need to then double that to be a trillion dollars just to kind of extend the time period to 16 weeks. And then I think you'll need another, you know, half a trillion at least to help businesses kind of get back to semi-normal as the summer progresses. And this is just for small businesses, you're thinking? That's just for small businesses, yeah. Right. But I mean, I, look, this is going to sound crazy, but I was doing some calculations this, this weekend. I think this whole thing is going to cost us as a country somewhere between 8 and $10 trillion of additional debt um, to kind of just get through that. Um, and, you know... But it's probably worth it, right? Because if we had a Great Depression, too, that would cost us a lot more trillion dollars. And so right, right. Uh, I think from that perspective, like a lot of people probably really hate Mitch McConnell, people who listen, who listen to us. <laughs> um, but I'm, so I'm going to say something that's very controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't think there was another person who could have gotten the Congress to agree to a $2.2 trillion spending bill in a matter of one week. Um, right. And so it's a pretty incredible thing that they got together and did this this fast. But I think that's just like a quarter of what they'll actually have to spend um, to get us through this. And, you know, good news is we actually can do that. And then we have the capacity to do it. And that, that's positive compared to, you know, what happened in, in the late 20s and early 30s. It, it doesn't make for controversial dialogue, but I, uh, I, I thoroughly agree <laughs> with what you're saying that, you know, economic life was not designed for uh, humans to not leave their homes. <laughs> and so it's going to be a weird more than a year, more than likely. But think about, I mean, so I'm originally from Georgia, the country, right? And um, yep. my dad still lives there and, and, you know, I have some other family. Now, 
again, this is all like a matter of comparison because even for him, so he's in Georgia and like um, the life in Georgia is much, much poorer than it is in the United States. And now, my dad is not really impacted at all because we can wire him money and, and he'll be fine. But everybody else in Georgia literally lives, you know, not paycheck to paycheck, but day to day, right? Sure. Like they make X number of uh, dollars a day and that's what they're going to live on for the next 24, 48 hours while they make more money. And so when you ask them to shut down, like that's even more crazy. Uh, now, the Georgian government's been actually super aggressive. And so they've shut the, the whole country down way faster than we did in the U.S. And so they've only had five or something deaths uh, from Corona um, and only have like 200 cases. But from the economic impact is just really incredible. And so as, as tough as it is for us here in the U.S. and, and Western Europe, um, for the developing world, this is going to set them back like decades because in the U.S. we can spend two and a half trillion dollars and then say, oh, that's not enough. We're going to spend another two and a half trillion dollars. Most developing countries don't have that kind of capacity, right? There's no way for them to get money to do that. And so um, that creates a really, really tough situation. And, and I think that um, the next, you know, couple of years, the really tough questions are going to have to be asked um, of the Chinese government as far as like them hiding uh, information about this for months on end and the incredible damage that it costs to the rest of the world and, and right. the, the need for them to basically pay reparations and trillions of dollars to everybody else for what they cost. Just just back to some of the hard decisions you had to make at Shift. Have you noticed the team kind of rallying around that at all? I mean, that's that's hard to, you know, wake up and see an email from your CEO or an all hands or however you, you chose to do it, that you're going to, you know, take home some substantial percentage less money, but, you know, stay employed. But however, I think on the flip side, you know, just the the larger situation is just so ever present on so many people's minds that, you know, I, I wonder if there's like a, like, a, okay, yeah, let's like, let's shelter in together as shift employees and do this. Totally. No, it's been actually really amazing. And I'm so, so proud of our team for how they've handled this. Um, it's been really, um, really, really incredible. So we did everything um, or as much as we could, we did by video. Um, so people who were furloughed, you know, at a corporate um level um the manager or the the function lead met with them um same thing in, in the field as much as possible we try to have meetings um by video it wasn't always possible but whenever we could um or or in person if possible as well so we try to do it kind of very carefully our numbers were lower um you know trip action or somebody had to do like 300 layoffs it's really hard to do um that over video right but then, uh, and then separately, we had a, a team-wide meeting and we talked to them about the salary cuts. And, um, you know, the team has rallied incredibly well um, to come together on this. Um, and I've just been really amazed by how hard everyone is working and trying to do everything possible to uh, make the company succeed, right, in, in an environment which is completely out of our control. We have no way of knowing when it, things will open up uh, uh, and what will happen next. But we can do the best we can to make sure that our customers are getting a really great experience and our product is serving uh, customers' needs. And we've implemented a um, kind of special fund to help people who absolutely need a car and are doing kind of uh, required work, like the kind of essential services. Uh, and so that was a really great idea that came from the team. And so we are giving people discounts um, if they are performing essential services to be able to have a car, oh, cool. um, which, is, which is awesome. Yeah. And, and because, you know, like in San Francisco last week, for example, Muni was completely shut down. It's so like, yeah. I don't know what the expectation was, how people are going to get to work. But that's kind of when we we came up with that. Um, and so uh, it, it's really tough, but the team's really, really rallied. And it's been really awesome um, to, to see. We are like launching products at really kind of incredible pace um, to make sure that we are able to kind of stay ahead of this. Um, for example, like this week, we're going to launch a new product in terms of how we are able to... Um, buy cars from customers. Um, so normally we just kind of buy and then we pay you right away. But right now that's really hard for us to do because we don't actually know where where the floor for the car pricing is going to be because everyone assumes that it's going to be like a 20% decrease in pricing um, at least. And so we're going to come out with an offer where we're still going to buy cars from people at a at a floor, floor price uh, and then share with them uh, in the upside above that amount. So if, say, we buy a car for 10000 and the car then sells for Fourteen will split at four thousand dollars with with the customer. That will allow us to like still buy cars from people because people still need, have a need to sell cars, but not have to kind of come in at rock bottom pricing. 
which is, you know, what you have to do right now because you don't know where the price is going to be. So it's been really awesome to watch a team kind of think really fast and make those types of things happen to respond to, to where the economy is. And so I'm pretty confident that we'll get through this. Like we've done the things we needed to kind of extend runway as much as possible and, and have the time to to look, look for alternative capital, which has been really good. And, and ultimately, I think, you know, we'll figure it out. But it's definitely a really, really tough time. And I feel especially bad for all the folks who are, you know, furloughed and not able to work with us uh, anymore and really hoping that as soon as we're open, we can kind of get as many people back as possible. You kind, you kind of answered my last question, but I wonder if there's more in there. And that's our own CEO, Phil, has been doing, I, I think, a really admirable job in balancing the sort of kind of rigorous, crazy optimism that's required <laughs> to be a, a, a startup a startup founder, but and at the same time kind of setting realistic expectations for a somewhat unprecedented situation. And he, uh, he kind of leaves us with these sayings from time to time. And one of them, he it was in a letter to the company and he signed off with uh, when the economy's strong, it's a really good time to sell things. And when the economy is weak, that's the best time to build things. And, you know, I, I wonder if as a founder yourself, you if that's a mentality that you take on or if that's something that shifts doing or if that's a, how, how you're identifying this as an opportunity, if, if at all possible. I, I generally agree with them, right? I think that in the next 24 months, some of the best companies we'll ever know are going to be started. Right. Like generally kind of, especially in the middle to tail end of a recession, um, you, you have some really great companies started and founders are going to do an amazing job with that, I'm sure. Um, so that's really, really positive. You know, at the same time, like a lot of businesses have to sell things to continue to exist, right? Like you right. couldn't exist without revenue. Um, and especially consumer businesses is really, really tough. Um, and so we have to continue being able to sell stuff, but we also need to build things really fast. And I do think that one of the reality has been that um, I think Silicon Valley became a little bit too complacent. Um, we just, our time has been too good. Like we, we, we've had way too great of a recovery for too long. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people have never lived through a difficult time. Um, so they kind of always thought that salaries will always continue going up. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't have to work as much as I used to, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not the real world. And so um, this is going to be a really tough kind of like being mugged by reality type of situation for a lot of people. Um uh, for better or for worse, uh, but I think it'll make us better because there'll be less complacency. Uh, people will work harder. Um, and, you know, as much as people being without work is awful, the fact that, you know, talent will be, uh, it'll be a little bit of a kind of company's market versus the talent's market, it will also help because we've gotten to the point where it was a little bit too too much, right? Like the the kind of demand was a little bit too crazy. Uh, and so from that perspective, I think for the purpose of building, it'll be a really, really great time. And so it's an awesome time to start a company, I think, in about six months from now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I share your views kind of across the board there. Uh, well, George, uh, you know, we really appreciate having you on. Shelter, you're, you're at home. You're in... Uh... Yeah, we're in Palo Alto and it's been, you know, we moved down here about a year ago and it's been, or not even nine months ago, and it's been really nice. We just had kids um, seven months ago and so... The one plus of all this is that I actually had a chance to see my children uh, way, way more than I uh, yeah, yeah. would have otherwise. And, um, you know, it's been really good because they're not like total babies anymore. They're still babies, but like not, you know, newborns. Uh -huh. um, and so it, it's a really great time to be bonding with them. And even though I'm still probably working like as much as I used or or more than I used to, the fact that I can like walk down there and say hi for five minutes, come back to, to my office um, has been really, really good. That's great. And uh, it's been really nice. Well, congratulations there. And, uh, and, and thank you again so much. Thank, thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. It was recorded in the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy-Thompson for producing, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Ommerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening. <laughs>